Today's homework video will cover the legislative branch of government, and I chose this one first because this is actually the branch of government explained first in our Constitution. When the framers were coming up with the branches of government during the Constitutional Convention, the legislative branch needed the most compromise so that each state could resolve their differences and come up with a logical plan that would meet every state's needs and concerns. The video will answer the following guiding questions. What are the four parts of the Constitution? What is Article I about? And what is the role of the legislative branch of government in the United States? So to begin, the U.S. Constitution is divided into four parts. You already know the first part of the Constitution, the preamble. In fact, you are memorizing this se first section of the Constitution with our preamble song. The second part of the Constitution is the largest and includes seven articles. The articles explain the three branches of government and lay out what the government can and cannot do. The third part of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights, which are the first ten amendments that come at the end of the Constitution. They list our freedoms and our rights as citizens that cannot be taken away and protect us from our government. These ten amendments were passed and included with the Constitution during the first few years that our government started. The last part of the Constitution are the other amendments that have been added on over time. As the years go by, certain rights become apparent that may not have been clear, stated, or protected before. For example, like women getting the right to vote, which is our 19th Amendment. You've seen this image before, the three branches of government in the shape of a tree. The trunk of the tree represents the Constitution, the law of the land itself, that holds up all the other branches. One branch is the legislative branch, who makes the laws. The second branch is the executive branch, which carries out the laws by enforcing them and putting them into action. The third branch of government is the judicial branch, which interprets the laws and decides if they are fair. Article 1 gives power to Congress, the legislative branch of the U.S. Constitution. This branch of government makes the laws. During the Constitutional Convention in 1787, there was a lot of controversy sur surrounding how many representatives each state should have in Congress, making the laws. States with many people living there had large populations like Virginia. They wanted to have more power than states with less people living there with smaller populations like New Jersey. In fact, they even named these plans after those states, and other representatives at the convention got behind one or the other, depending on their state's populations. But this created a big problem about what to do, because about half of the representatives wanted the New Jersey plan, and the other half wanted the Virginia plan. Draw Virginia and New Jersey arguing over who should get more representatives in Congress next to your notes. The solution was introduced by James Madison, and known today as the Great Compromise. Basically, Madison combined both ideas so that both big states and little states could be happy and feel like they were respected and represented in Congress fairly. This enabled both sides of the issue to agree. Go ahead and take a moment to draw the following image in your notes to represent the U.S. Congress as one house with two parts. Title one side, the Senate, with two senators per state, and the, on the other side, title it the House, which is the House of Representatives, with more people, more votes. A quick sketch of New Jersey on the Senate side and Virginia on the House side wouldn't hurt either. The legislative branch makes the laws, and because of the Great Compromise, Congress includes two parts, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives has 435 members, and depending on how many people live in each state, they get to send more or less of those 435 representatives to Washington, D.C. to go make the laws for our country. Currently, Virginia has 11 representatives that make laws in the House. That is a lot compared with Rhode Island, who only gets two, because less people live in Rhode Island than Virginia. But look how many states like California and New York get because their populations are even larger. The Senate is the other part of Congress that gets the other half of the power in making the laws for our country. The Senate has a total of 100 members, and each of the 50 states gets two senators. 
This is the part of the Great Compromise that made the little states like New Jersey happy because no matter how many people live in a state, each state gets two senators to represent their state when making federal laws in Washington, D.C. We call this two-house legislative government a bicameral system. Bi is the prefix that means two. And the Senate and the House of Representatives are the two houses of Congress in the U.S. I like this graphic organizer because it shows visually the differences between the Senate and the House in regards to how many senators and how many representatives each state gets. Now let's compare other differences between senators and representatives that are listed out in Article 1 of the Constitution. Senators serve for four years before having to get re-elected, whereas representatives serve only two years. Check out how many more people a senator represents in his or her state compared with how many a representative represents. Have you ever noticed that the Capitol building is symmetrical on either side? There's a reason for this. You see, the Senate chambers are located on the left side of the Capitol building and the House of Representatives meets on the right side of the building. Article 1 also tells the minimum age for representatives and senators. Notice, you have to be five years older than a representative to be a senator. Consider this, a congressman or woman from Georgia speaks only for his or her specific district, in this case District 14, because those are the people in Georgia who elected him or her. He does not represent the people living in District 1. But the senator represents the whole state, in this case, like I said, Georgia. That includes all the districts, including 14 and 1. In a typical year, more than 5,000 bills are introduced in Congress, but only about 150 of them actually become laws. So how does Congress make laws? Here's the uncomplicated version, but just recognize there are more steps that you will be learning about in 8th grade. Sticking with just the basics, there are about seven steps. First, a bill is introduced by a member of Congress. Then the bill goes to a committee and a subcommittee to be properly written and discussed and argued about and rewritten again and again. Sometimes the committee may even kill the bill if most of them think it's a bad idea. After that process, which often takes a long time, the committee votes on whether a bill is good enough to pass on to the whole Senate or the whole House of Representatives, depending on which member of Congress first introduced it. If a senator first introduced the bill, the whole Senate first has to agree and pass it. But if a representative first introduced the bill, then the whole House of Representatives has to agree to pass it. And it's not over. The process is only halfway done. Then the bill goes to the other house, the other part of Congress. So if a bill started out in the Senate, it goes over to the House Committee and the House of Representatives to be argued over and passed through their House subcommittees and finally to be agreed on by the whole House of Representatives. If the bill started out in the House of Representatives, it would get sent over to the Senate for the whole Senate committee to argue about and pass through their subcommittees to eventually be agreed on by the majority of the Senate to be approved. That is why steps two through five start all over again. Once the bill has been approved by both the House and the Senate, then the bill goes to the president to be signed into law. But here's the catch. He doesn't have to sign it if he doesn't want to. If he doesn't like it, he can actually veto it. And that starts the process all over again.